A reading from Mark, chapter 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, I'm sorry, and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised. He's not here. Look, there's the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, because they were afraid. That story, more or less, has been told for 2,000 years. I imagine most Christians accept some version of the idea that Jesus, the person, died and then came back to life. Jesus rose from the dead in a supernatural, miraculous way. That's probably the most common definition of what Christians celebrate at Easter. That's the Easter that I was raised on, and I always found the idea inspiring and spiritually fulfilling. Maybe you did too, maybe you still do. Today, however, I'd like to at least engage the possibility that that understanding of Easter may miss the point of resurrection. What if Jesus did not come back to life? And what if that's a good thing? Believe it or not, that actually could be good news. Good news that we need to hear now more than ever. Because we have lived through the Lent of Lents, and we are still living it. I know it's Easter and Lent should be over, but it doesn't feel like it. We've fasted from physical contact, fasted from communal gatherings, fasted from foods and short supply at the grocery store. Millions around the globe have fasted from human touch as entire nations enforce isolation. It feels like we're still in our tombs. The events of the last week of Jesus' life, Holy Week, culminate in a crown of thorns pressed down upon his head as he was crucified. A crown of thorns, a crown, or in Espanol, a corona of thorns. These past weeks, it's been as if a corona of thorns has been pressed down upon our heads. To some degree, we're all suffering. Not all of us are infected with COVID-19, of course, but we are infected with the sort of spiritual virus of fear. COVID-19, like with COVID-19, our symptoms of being infected with fear may be moderate or severe. Some of us don't show any symptoms at all, but fear is still there. It's felt in some way. Maybe we're going about our lives just fine, but we have strange dreams at night. Or we'll realize that our shoulders are tensed up, checking on the stock market a lot, or being afraid to look. Maybe we struggle to focus on tasks that used to be easy. Some of us are alone in our homes. Some are living with others and wish we were alone, at least at times. We know we should be grateful, and we are grateful that we have everything we need. But we miss our old way of living. We miss people. We miss hugs. At least some of us do. And we're apprehensive. How long will this go on? When will things get back to normal? 
We are all suffering. Suffering, of course, the universal human condition in the Christian tradition, the cross, is the symbol of suffering. When you strip away the elaborate theology, the cross means death. And when we claim the cross as our own, it becomes a symbol not only of the death of Jesus, but of all the deaths we know and have known. Jesus' path led to the cross and then through it on the other side was the tomb. Jesus' body was laid in it, the stone rolled in front of it, and incubation began. Three days later, the stone was rolled away. Jesus, the suffering human being, died and was buried in the tomb. He remained there. What emerged was the Christ, who was and is the divine compassion he taught and practiced. That is the Christ who lives today, but he has a different sort of body. Over the past months, as the coronavirus has spread, we've witnessed tens of thousands of literal deaths worldwide. <clears throat> Over 100,000 people have contracted the virus and died, more than 20,000 in the United States. And behind each one of those deaths, <clears throat> There are the unknown losses of friends and family who loved them. These literal deaths are often mourned virtually since we can't gather for memorial services or funerals. But what else is dying right now? And what may be rising in its place? How is the story of resurrection unfolding now? As we look closer at our current reality, perhaps there are some assumptions and entitlements that are also dying. Theologian Jim Burklow writes, the effect of coronavirus is that the politics of me first is dead. The politics of greed and selfishness, dead and buried. Rising from the empty tomb is awareness that we are all in this struggle together. End quote. In this age of coronavirus, we're finally realizing we are all in this together. We can hardly deny it now. With coronavirus, our complacency about the fate of our neighbors near and far, and our carelessness about the condition of our natural world, has died and been buried. The stone is rolled away from the tomb, and from it will rise a policy of unconditional compassion for all people and for our planet. With coronavirus, the idea that public health can be privatized is dead and buried. Rising from its tomb is the spreading conviction that health care must be guaranteed for all, regardless of the ability to pay. As long as any of us are sick, we are all at risk. Theologian Taliesin Zongren Foley asked, what if Jesus is dead and it's a good thing? Is Easter really about one man 2,000 years ago who was divine and so he miraculously rose from the dead? He lives again? Is that all Easter is to us? Or is resurrection a much broader truth? What if life really does follow death, not just once centuries ago, but always? Resurrection is never about returning to a previous life. Jesus' body, bruised and battered to the point of death, didn't begin to breathe again. But spring does follow winter. Life does follow death. And here's the trick. It's never the same. There's no going back. New life is different than the old life that came before it. And in order for new life to come, the old life has to go. 
In the case of Jesus, the life of a single, solitary human being ended. He died. We will all die. To be human is to die. But from the death of his body arises a new kind of body, the body of Christ, all of us who have come after him. And all of us, Jesus' new body, can do much greater things than even Jesus did. In John's Gospel, Jesus says, Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in resurrection, believes in me, will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than I do. Reducing resurrection to a magic trick that happened once a long time ago diminishes its power. It relegates resurrection safely in the past, for it no longer challenges us to look for it. Maybe life really does come after death. If we really believe that, then we just might be looking for it, alert to the new life that is emerging from the destruction we see. Jesus was crucified, but he could not be silenced. Maybe the ancient, beautiful stories about this powerful ancestor, Jesus, were never intended to be taken literally, any more than the story of Ezekiel's dry bones reassembled with tendons and flesh was intended as factual. What would happen this Easter if we let Jesus go? And if we instead stepped into our role as his new body, charged with continuing his work. What if we found something holy and healing and free and now? What if we lived resurrection? <laughs>